you're just not playing Some weak and casual game You practice putts, you practice winning You're head of a disc of fame And now you're disc of famous Soon everyone will know Hey. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> Ooh, great. Doing great. I love it when you get, you just fly off the top. I mean, I'd love to practice with you sometime, but like, I think you're always in the moment and I love it. So, uh, <laughs> oh, thanks. Chris, how are you doing today, tonight, Chris? I heard y'all got to get, go experience Moody's for the first time, right? It was quite impressive. So I got my hand over the. Is that your screen. foot? It's my place. Yeah, I'm very <laughs> ambidextrous, as you can see. Voila. No, I wanted y'all to see the drive that Hemi and I got to look at the whole way there. <laughs> well, at least you get to see the picture of it now without me inside. <laughs> Did you fall, Chris? <laughs> All right, we're cutting him off. No more wine. <laughs> Oh my it God. was. Let me just describe it. It was spectacular, and I drove through. We drove separately. I drove through Smithville, and uh, I love it. Little country drive. Um, it just felt like home. You know, it just felt this vibe. As soon as I got into those little towns that don't have stores, I love towns that don't have convenience stores. You know, it's just just amazing. And, and, and the closest one there out. has a little bar connected to this like a quarter of a like corner store <laughs> there's not much in there and yeah. then if you go into the back there's a bar <laughs> well and you you know you're getting into mexican food land too when you i don't know i love the the, the food out there we ate it what was it called Pal Pal los palama or the one right next to bucky's you know what i'm talking about oh yeah you guys went to casa chapala chapala oh yes they, it's they hand make salsa right in front of you to your they do patients if you want it hot it's so good yeah so i'm glad stupid. you liked it i'm glad it was a good recommendation because that's literally like 1.2 miles from my house so we like it there <laughs> yeah i loved it the service everything it's great Anyway, well, we have a show tonight, and uh, Meredith, why don't you lead us off, tell us what's going on. So we want to bring up, we have a Lucky Ace uh, Blazing coming up soon, which is why I got to go out and um, experience the Moody's before you go, uh, you know, play it. It's one of the most beautiful courses in Texas, and I can't wait to get back out there. And um, we have a special guest coming on tonight as well with uh, Shinovar with the Discraft Underground, and he is going to inform us and get a, give us all the scoop of what the underground is up to, you know, the, the platform it is for Discraft and so much more. Um, and then we had such an exciting weekend. I'm so glad the Sling Show, Hemi and Chris got to go um, film the Houston Youth. Is it the Young Guns Disco? Young Guns. I knew the Young Guns. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, Hemi. Uh -huh. And I it I got to tune in some and it was so precious. But it was like look watching like a little world event. It was so they were so professional and good. It was entertaining. Thank you all for going out there and capturing that. Uh, it blew my mind. And I want to say too that there was a mini going on that seemed like a really good sweet money mini. You know I don't I can't remember. I think it was at. Uh, I can't remember which course it was, but I saw that posted and I was like, man, I really like to go play that mini, <laughs> but, but we had already committed and I'm so glad we did. And, and, um, uh, had a, got a, picked up a screw in my tire on the way there. And so I ended up having a flat tire and realized that I don't even have a jack or a spare in my car. 
because we I just purchased that van like like last year and I didn't even know this thing came with no so I was kind of stranded there and I had to uh, call my son to drive off all the way out there with his girlfriend which worked out really great because they got to see it you know they got to see what oh. was going on I mean, they get there right right at the end sort of like the last few holes I was glad they got to see that I, I'm so glad we did it I can't believe you know the talent I mean they, these these kids have been doing this league for months and and you can tell and not just doing the league but with really really good um, coaching and and the parents were so supportive and they were behind them you know there was a gallery on every card and the gallery was the parents and the grandparents and the siblings and you know the families it was just a family event it was unlike anything I've ever seen in a lot of ways better than worlds because they were supported you know it was just a community effort mm -hmm. and amazing and then you know just get on go over there and to our page and click on them we've got like three videos we pretty much did the whole event because they they broke it down into two nine hole uh, nine rounds of nine and okay. uh, 18 holes and they broke it apart which i thought was really brilliant because mm -hmm. these kids are you know it's hot i mean it's it's like boiling hot and if you're not a disc golfer that's used to that kind of uh, weather it can be taxing and these kids were you know at first, it was a little bit of a struggle, I think, for them, and and then they kind of got into the groove. Yeah, uh, well, Zuby is is very wide open. There's there's yeah. not much to you know hide from in the shade there, so that was really cool. That mm -hmm. makes and they had mo they had modified the layout for them as well, and I think him and I both observed after 12 weeks, and these ch these kids were seven to 12 years old, mind you, as well. Six. Um, Six to 12 however that kid had turned seven but i got you six to twelve that was the age of the kids there um but the the neat thing was is that if you go back and you look at their form it was incredible there were some interviews that we were able to get with these kids they were so talkative i highly recommend you go back and watch them when we, they were asked who their favorite player was i think the consensus of the one kid of the kids who answered it it was eagle mcmahon and i loved one of the kids answers to the question i was like well why is he your favorite and I thought he was going to say something about kids like, oh, he's cool. I like his disc or whatever. He's like, no, he has every shot. And he said it just deadpan, just like that. And I was like, wow, that's quite impressive from such a young man watching video. And obviously he's doing it with his, his dad. But, you know, it went way deeper than just the, uh, the shots that they played. But being able to talk with them and see the excitement, the exuberance in which they had, for God's sakes, Henry and I ran about, a hundred yards to catch the yelling and the screaming because one of the young contestants, Jacob, hit a 170 foot air to chain backhand ace. And it was a no doubter. And it was amazing. We got his interview as well. And I'm telling you, if I could bottle up a feeling for every person, and if you've ever played in anything that you've had the ultimate success in, his reaction inside of himself is priceless it was infectious i got I, I was just feeling it while i was there it, it was quite wonderful so if you have an opportunity to go back and watch it too because the support was incredible i haven't, haven't had a chance to, to label them but they're the most recent three videos so if you go to the fling show page and click on those videos and you can you know you can 10 second around and check out all the different at the first nine we filmed every card and uh, we just kind of hopped around and we started with the ladies and the, the girls were like six, you know, I mean, yeah. and there were four of them and, you know, six to nine, I, I would, I'm guessing, but uh, that's where we started. And, and uh, then we filmed the lead card after that. So at, towards the end, you'll watch uh, the 12 year olds battling it out. And it was two brothers, um, uh, AJ and Manny, I think were their names. I'm not sure if AJ's right. It's something like that, JJ or something. But anyway, they were battling it out, and they both par uh, birdied the first four holes, and that's that started it off. That set the tone, and and uh, Manny was like the one. He's the taller kid, but I think he was younger. And uh, and when we were kind of chatting with them beforehand, his bigger, the big brother was the one to beat. He was like the guy. And Manny took him down and we could see that fire in his eye. We could see him focus, you know, just like somebody on tour. And um, 
Uh, just uh, what a day, you know. I'll be back. We'll do that. And again. this right here is Jacob. This is the young man. He was so proud. His dad reached out to us. And I would love to read the, the, the email that he sent to us, but I think I'd tear up through it and it'd be hard for me to get through. But what a special moment for this young man. And I told him I'd highlight him on the show this evening and uh what just an incredible time i'm telling you, you just look at the smile on his face right there it's a bazillion degrees but it just didn't matter it didn't it did not and he, it was so good to go watch him go back and have lunch and talk about it and the other kids talking to him about it i mean it was precious and this is that picture this is mid-round the mid-round ace interview <laughs> which oh. never never <laughs> happens but he yeah. didn't want to stop talking either we we kind of had to Okay, let's. You need to keep playing, <laughs> right? Keep it going. It's hard buddy. to keep playing once you get that adrenaline. Nothing ever works after that. <laughs> all right. Well, I know we could talk about this all night long, Meredith. I know we have a special guest on this evening, um, so I, we need to throw that on to you. And uh... yes, has he joined us? Yes, he's here. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, I would like to introduce to you. We have Wes. Navar with Discraft Underground. How are you doing tonight, Wes? Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I'm doing really well. Hey, Wes. Thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I love the conversation about the junior tournaments because I think it's something that anybody who enjoys disc golf can also go enjoy uh, because I I've seen it with some of the junior players in my area too and uh these kids just love disc golf you know they just they love throwing a disc they love watching it fly um you know they're, they're really living for making some big putts and having some great lines and it's so infectious and I, I think just like you said you know you can kind of uh kind of get some of that energy or just sort of seep some of that energy that those those young players have and kind of bring that back to your game and your practice and stuff that you're doing i, I think it's a great way for somebody who has been playing disc golf for a long time and it's, it's maybe just kind of, you know, plateaued or just kind of, uh, kind of going through the motions go watch those little guys play and just watch the, the energy and joy that they have for the game. And I think you, it'll bring a little bit more back to your game too. I think one thing that him and I both noticed when, when they were playing, if you go back and watch them, even the young ones, their form was amazing. There were some people who had a stand and deliver shot. I always, Mayor has a beautiful standard delivery shot. Go back and watch a couple of these juniors throw. And I'm talking about with distance as well. And their putting form, Hemi Putt pointed out, he goes, who does that remind you of? And there was a putting uh, a comp young competitor that was there. And literally the moment that you watched their put, uh, him putt, he looked like Paige Pierce. I mean, just the form and everything else, just perfect. The flatness, the form of the putts. It was amazing to well, watch. Well, the little flip up right before we throw those, <laughs> yep. you know, That's the thing. That was the giveaway. And then, oh. Yeah, it's so exciting. I think the, the, the next generation uh, is set up so well with, uh, you know, players like Paige Pierce and Paul Macbeth. And you mentioned Eagle McMahon as some of the kids' favorite players, too. And uh, these, these young guys are set up to kind of build upon what we have today. And so it's going to be super exciting, I think, in the near future here and or even you know 10 years out to see what these guys do with with disc golf mm -hmm. i just watched uh just finally caught up and somehow managed to not know i didn't check any scores or stayed away from facebook and so i watched the pro tour today and uh what was the kid's name that won he seemed like he was like 14 14 Kyle. Like, uh, Kyle. <laughs> and he took, he took it down and he hadn't birdied that last hole you know, all the whole weekend and, and he birdies it for the win. And uh, it was spectacular watching this kid play. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Klein's a Michigan kid. I've got to see him probably more than most people had really seen him come up uh, kind of through the ranks the last couple of years as well. So uh, maybe not a big surprise to people around Michigan, but a little bit more of a surprise nationally for people who haven't really seen him just make strides year after year, the last several years here. Uh, he's, he's 19, but just really a tremendous talent. And I think kind of the tip of the iceberg of what I'm going to kind of call the, the sort of next generation of disc golfers, uh, you have, you know, some guys like Cole Redolin, we saw in the last couple of weeks, you got Kyle mm -hmm. Klein, 
Um, you have another kid named Nolan Ramser, who's uh, out of Kansas, I believe it is. And you have these kids that are kind of reaching this 18 to 20 age who, you know, are, are now about 10 years younger than, than Paul and Ricky, uh, roughly, and are kind of building on what those guys built on. And then you have this next generation, I think, kind of after them that we were kind of talking about, those juniors that are now kind of seven to 10 years old, um, who are going to be kind of a decade behind these kids. And so, uh, yeah, I think Kyle Klein is uh, really just probably the tip of the iceberg for this next generation that's coming. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of 18 to 22 year old guys making noise on tour over the next couple of years here. Yeah, we just want to chime in we, and, yes. um, oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> no, I was just about to say we had two uh, gentlemen in our area that went to Worlds. That one was leading Worlds in his division as well, Mr. Montenegro and Mr. Bente. You might want to look those two juniors up from down here, both of them between that 18 uh, year old uh, right now. And I'm telling you right now, we've seen them grow up the last couple of years. You're going to be seeing them play in these tournaments uh, and you're going to see them in the, the top 10 for sure, because they've got talent galore. I overheard one time uh, Philberg was talking about this, about how, you know, you, you guys talking about, me people that started late i was chris doesn't believe this but i started when i was like 31 32 years old so you know phil billberg was like basically you guys are screwed because <laughs> you're gonna have to spend your whole time unlearning bad habits and these kids i mean these 12 year olds six year olds you know they've already got everything they need in terms of form all they got to do is just get the mental side and and, um, but Hemi, and even the butts. sisters, you know, the fact that they pretty much do upshots that, and that they hardly played rounds, that's such a different perspective than majority, you know, like the rest of us, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to play rounds when all they really did was they're practicing putting or they're practicing upshots or just, you know, field work and things like that. So, yeah, no wonder they've soared. <laughs> well, in the past couple of weeks, we've been talking – uh, kind of bouncing off the the twisties that um, Simone got in the Olympics, and when comparing that to the the yips, and uh, and these kids are you know 30, 40 years from the yips, and you could tell you know in the tournament there was no hesitation whatsoever about a putt, and and they made lots of putts, and uh, and no 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 nerves, no yips, um, so really. Cool. I like Wes's advice. I'm going to go back and watch and get that revived. <laughs> so, Wes, you, miss, you mentioned Michigan. Have you always lived in Michigan? Yeah, I have lived in Michigan my whole life. Uh, I've been fortunate to travel uh, all different places around the world, which is a, a great experience and probably a conversation for another show. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've traveled uh, all around the world, but – always seem to come back to Michigan. I, this is where my family is from. And so uh, a lot of family ties here and Michigan uh, is really known for the disc golf, which, you know, kind of came a little bit later, say a little bit later, but uh, relatively a little bit later in my life. And uh, so certainly a lot of pull to Michigan for that these days as well. Well, how did it get, like, how did you get connected into disc golf? I was going to ask you that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think probably like a lot of people, I played disc golf a little bit in high school, uh, just with some friends. We had a free course that was put in, I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s, so a relatively old course, which means all of the holes are pretty much 300 feet straight in front of you. <laughs> um, and so I had just kind of played that casually, not really knowing what I was doing in high school, and then uh, went to college, and after college, I came back and had kind of reconnected with some old friends uh, and made some new friends. And I got into a game called Guts Frisbee, uh, which some people might know or might not know. It's uh, the easiest way to describe it is kind of like dodgeball, but with a Frisbee sort of game. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty intense. <laughs> um, so I, I played that for a few years and uh, I kind of found disc golf. A lot of uh, Guts Frisbee players also play ultimate and disc golf and are, are kind of multi um, disc sport athletes. And so I, I got into disc golf and I think like a lot of people, I went out and I, you know, had one disc and I bought two more pretty quick. So I knew I needed a, a driver and a, 
a putter and I think all I had was a, a mid range of some sort. And so I got three discs and was just hooked on the different ways to throw the disc and the different flights that you could get out of a disc. And uh, I, I feel like I tend to somewhat have a little bit of a, a obsessive uh, personality sometimes. So, <laughs> so immediately that led to me, you know, buying 20, 30, 40 more discs and uh, just going out to the field and just throwing all of them as many times as I could until my arm was tired and uh, just really falling in love with kind of the flight of the disc. And um, I've also been a, a collector of random things throughout my life as well. So kind of early on got into the collector side of uh, discs as I was getting more into playing as well. And then it just kind of all snowballed from there into where we are today. That's amazing. Now, when I first met you, I actually, it kind of comes full circle. So when I first came on to the Sling Show, our first guest was Trevor and Courtney. And yeah. so that's who I met you from. And, you know, when they first started kind of putting a bug in my ear that they had mentioned me to you and, and, um, I was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean? Like, what is it? And they were like, oh, I mean, you're like kind of a street team. And they kind of told me what you're looking for. And um, it was such a blessing to get connected with you and, you know, to be here we are. And um, so how did you get connected with this craft? Uh, was it something you found right away once you found the sport and loved it from the beginning? Or was it something you got into later? Yeah, I mean, I, I got really involved with the uh, a lot of the Facebook pages and started interacting with the community a lot there and kind of became a little bit of a, a figure sort of through the, the sales community, uh, just buying and selling stuff and making a lot of friends through the social media pages. And from there, it kind of expanded into, you know, just sort of uh, building my personal image a little bit because I, I knew that that was really uh, something that was important kind of for these teams. I, I was kind of watching what you know, a lot of the pros were doing and try and emulate that on sort of a, a smaller scale. And at the time, my rating was, you know, terrible. My rating is still relatively terrible. But <laughs> um, yeah, I was playing a lot more and really doing a lot of field work and working to improve my rating and, and uh, just try and make a difference in my community a little bit more than uh, on the course, necessarily. Um, I think it kind of started with a uh, being a Michigan guy, Discraft is a Michigan company. Uh, I think very early on, I was a, a Nate Doss fan, which um, it's hard not to be. He's just the nicest guy in the whole world. And he, you know, was uh, really such a great player in the kind of 2015, 16 era there. A uh, couple world titles, just, you know, very simple game that I felt like was fun to watch. He made everything look so easy. Um, and so I was really just a Discraft fan from the get-go. Uh, Michigan company, love to support Michigan companies. And then just on top of uh, being a, a Nate Doss fan, I was really just kind of enamored with Discraft as a brand um, and kind of the, the direction that they seem to be going with things, the players they had. Uh, they sponsor a lot of tournaments around Michigan as well. So I knew that they were a really good company, that they had really good intentions and that, you know, a lot of uh, what it seemed like their company values were kind of aligned with a lot of my personal values as well. So did you come on um, as like a captain or how did, or did you become on a team disc craft first? How did that work out? Yeah, I think like a lot of people, uh, I had contacted Bob Julio and said, Bob, I'd love to be on team disc craft. <laughs> uh, at the, the time they had the ambassador team, uh, which was, you know, people that were kind of like myself who were, maybe sort of building a, an image on the social media side a little bit more, but also involved in uh, tournaments, you know, maybe looking to run tournaments and just kind of being a little bit more of that sort of influencer, I guess is the, the word that I'll use, but people who are also still um, playing tournaments and doing well. And so, uh, you know, like a lot of people, I was, my rating was really too low to kind of qualify for that. Um, but as time went on, I was really consistent I think with my effort to kind of build my name and sort of um, continue to connect with the disc golf community at large and kind of connect with players and figure out how I could kind of help players do uh, more with what they had going on and kind of help them elevate their sort of image uh, or standing as well, especially through social media. And so I, I think, you know, at some point, um, I think it was be beginning of 2018, roughly, uh, 
Bob Julio had given me a call and he said, Hey Wes, uh, we, we have a project that we've kind of had in mind for a little while. Uh, we think you might be a, a good person for it. Could you come, come visit the factory for a day? And, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. So of course, any player's dream is to go visit the factory and, <laughs> and, uh, and check things out. And so I got to go sit down with, uh, Bob Julio and, and Mike Wagner, who is the CEO, and, and kind of talked to those guys about the underground uh, in the, the very early stages of its development and, um, you know, just kind of the idea behind it and, and sort of take a lot of the kind of ideas and philosophies that they had sort of with their ambassador team and kind of move it over to this new team with uh, a new idea, still social media oriented, but also still some great players that, you know, maybe aren't quite to the team discraft level uh, just yet, but, you know, still deserving of some level of sponsorship. So in the very early stages, uh, the underground is, was very similar basically to, to what it is today, just uh, on a lot smaller scale. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that was, it was just the team uh, idea at first and did, and then it grew into more. Would you like to, Elaborate. Sure. Yeah. Uh, to start, we had about 10 people. Uh, and I, I know you had shared the Ledgestone post as well. We got to, I got to go on the uh, live coverage for Ledgestone in the booth with Terror Bear. And we got to kind of announce the underground uh, through that platform. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. I was extremely nervous. It was really my first time kind of having the camera turned on me, even though I had done a lot of social media, it just felt a lot more, uh, a lot more formal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we had about 10 people to start just to kind of like test the idea, you know, see um, sort of what the, the reaction was, see how it worked with the players, kind of build some foundations on how uh, the sponsorship would work, uh, sort of kind of uh, test some of the goals that we had with those early players and make sure that the ideas that we had were going to work through social media uh, and beyond. So yeah, we started with 10 people, uh, 10 or 11 people. And then uh, pretty quickly, it was a, a big success. <laughs> there was a lot of interest. Uh, we had, you know, almost a thousand applications, I think within the first, first couple of months of the team kind of forming. And so, you know, really interest was uh, certainly beyond anything that I expected. Uh, I go back through and, and read all of the applications and I was like, oh, you know, I'll be able to kind of go through and read them uh, once in a while and, and catch up and we'll do recruitment from there. And uh, they just came flooding in so, so quickly. Uh, it was a little, a little more work very early on than, than I anticipated. But um, yeah, so we, we go through the, the app process and then... Uh, you know, recruitment really grew from there. Wow, that's amazing. So um, at this point, how many do you have and, and you know, where? Yeah, uh, we, well, we have people all over the U.S. Um, and I think the our team size, we're under 100. I believe 98 is the number of total players we have, which I, I think would probably surprise people. Um, I know a lot of people have come to me in the past and like, Oh, you guys have, you know, 200 or 300 people. It's crazy. I see you guys everywhere. And it's like, actually we have less than a hundred people here in the U S uh, it's just, you know, we have great people doing great things that are, are making a lot of noise. And then we also have a, a small contingency over in Finland as well. Uh, Finland really being the, you know, the biggest or second biggest disc golf country in partnership with the U S. Um, and so we have a, a small team over there that I'm hoping we can expand if COVID stuff lightens up a little bit, so there's a little bit more um, international travel available for people. Right. Awesome. Um, Mary, if I ask a question real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, kind of speak to now, you, you know, we hear the past, we like to, one of the things that we do here at the playing show is, is we're trying to bring light to the players who are looking for sponsorships. We've, We've been lucky enough to interview quite a few Innova sponsored players, Discraft sponsored players, some disc makers as well in our area. We've been able to interview them and, and kind of see what it is that they're looking for and how it is that they can get the attention of people such as yourself to get on teams like this. And what is it the benefit to them from it? What 
what might they get from it? And where do you see your team in the future? He yeah. loves when I ask these long, long questions, like two or three things. He loves that. Yeah, I might have to pick this one apart or have you ask parts of it again. <laughs> you got to take uh, notes when Chris asks. <laughs> asks yeah, I forgot my notepad. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of, excuse me, in terms of uh, kind of what we're looking for, uh, we just have a big focus on social media. It's become such a important part of players building their image and kind of building their brand uh, along the way as well. So social media is always a really big one. Uh, anything from, you know, posts uh, about your favorite discs, why they work great for you, tournament recaps, throwing videos. Uh, I always tell people, a little editing can go a long way because uh, it's it's pretty tricky to do any sort of video editing. Uh, there's a lot of really great apps out there that are, are making it easier, but a little editing, I think, makes um, videos a lot more interesting if you're able to do that. Uh, initially, we, we really just kind of had social media requirements, but it's really grown since then because we have almost 3,000 applications for the team uh, at this point. So we're looking for people that are also playing tournaments, uh, we have a, a five tournament minimum, but we're looking for people that are probably playing, you know, eight to 10 tournaments, just getting out in their area, making sure that they're involved on the local scene. Um, and then people that are also making a difference in their community as well, outside of just disc golf tournaments, uh, people maybe that are running tournaments, running leagues, uh, volunteering at their local courses to, you know, pick up trash or just improve the courses in general. So really those are kind of the three big things that I always tell people is the uh, social media side, just getting out to tournaments and really just having a positive image about you. We don't want anybody who is, you know, kicking their bag or punching trees or, or doing anything like that. Uh, I'm just a good, clean, professional image and then making a difference in your community. And, and these days we're looking for people that are pretty much firing on all three, but you know, there's certainly people that are excelling in some areas more than others. Sometimes people are, you know, really killing it on tournaments. We've got several people that are close to or at a thousand rated. Um, and then we have other people that are more focused on the social media side and creating uh, interesting posts and good videos and a big mix of things. Right. Hey, hey, uh, um, and I, I like that with the not being tape film because him and I, kind of found that out when we first started this endeavor because that was what we were known for is getting the people who weren't known kind of lost the audio there with chris on video oh did you oh yeah, can you hear me now? yeah. And we, we were getting them on video for the first time and people who hadn't been on it you know watching the language watching the reaction because it's not i mean maybe right then nobody saw it but we know this kind of platform, once it's out there, it's always out there for everyone to see. So that yeah. was one thing we had to overcome ourselves and kind of mention to the people and the players that, hey, just so you know, this is out there for perpetuity and, and it's not really going to go anywhere else. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. But my follow up, my final question was, you know, where do you see Team Discraft moving in the future? And then I know Hemi has a question. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll touch just super briefly on the kind of professional image too. And I, I think disc golf is really pushing towards that. And you have the pros that are kind of leading the way with the professional image with, you know, Paige Pierce and Paul Macbeth are, you know, very clean outfits for their tournaments, uh, very professional social media. I think disc golf is really moving away from, you know, I guess what I'll call kind of the hippie sport mentality that it, it used to be of baggy clothes and, and maybe jean shorts and really moving to, uh, a lot more professional image, at least on the sponsorship side. But uh, in terms of, you know, kind of where the, the underground uh, is going in the future, I imagine we'll continue to expand the team. This has been a little bit slower year with manufacturing, you know, really being behind due to the explosive uh, growth of disc golf. So kind of consistently, we've been a, a little bit slower with the underground this year, but we'll continue to expand the team. Uh, I think at the end of last year, maybe before we were at maybe 115 or so people. And I could definitely see us kind of ramping back up to that number next year as manufacturing sort of picks back up and disc golf really gets back into uh, a full swing. Hopefully this, this COVID pandemic kind of gets behind us and we can all kind of get back to doing the things that we love to do. And I think disc golf is, is something that is so unique and, you know, has just really thrived through, through all of it. We've seen the growth, uh, 
on social media at tournaments the the fans that are coming out to spectate are just coming out in uh in record numbers so i definitely think that we'll continue to grow um we have a lot of really great players on the team and and we move people up to team discraft annually which is a, a little bit bigger sponsorship but of course has bigger requirements to get to that level um so we have a, a lot of players that are on the underground that are, are working towards that and several players who are on team discraft now that were uh former underground players were, that we were able to work with and uh kind of help them grow and, and get up to that level and so i'm sure that we'll continue to do that as well well you, you kind of answered a lot of my questions there mine was about <laughs> the uh the team uh, the the team the um the actual team how many players on the uh, the pro players do you have uh, how many professional players on the underground or how many people on Team Discraft? On Team Discraft. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Team Discraft, I want to say, has around 60 or so people. Okay. Uh, I think is what it is. Yep. And, and the other question was about there is, do you see a lot of, of uh, outside companies coming in and helping with the social media, helping with the, I know that your company helps with that. You just answered that earlier. Uh, but as far as like doing the social and then, you know, just the basic uh, road scheduling and management, is, you know, is, is that kind of happening now in the sport? Yeah. Well, this, Across is a, the board? this is a very interesting question because it's something I really looked into a lot this past year because I think we're starting to see some of the top guys like Paul Macbeth and Ricky Wysocki have people that are managing their tour uh, or, you know, Paul Macbeth specifically has a, a disc golf agent that helps him with negotiating his deals and endorsements and um, all of the like. And I, I think it's a really interesting facet of disc golf that is growing. I think for it to make sense, these pros have to be making a little bit more money than they're making today in order for them to be able to pay someone else to handle some of those things. Uh, you know, I, I think really the top uh, probably 30 or 40 professional disc golfers are, are doing pretty well. I think the top 10 guys are doing phenomenal, but I think that really needs to expand to, you know, the top uh, probably 75 or, you know, potentially even a hundred guys who are able to take disc golf and make it a living before we start to see people that are more social media managers and tour managers and really see that become, uh, you know, an auxiliary full-time job for someone that is helping these disc golfers but i do think it's very interesting i i think it's coming and i think we're really on the the cusp of it because these top guys do have people that are, are doing those things so i think once the money really grows for kind of that next tier of players those guys right now that are you know maybe world ranked kind of uh 10 through 30 once they're making money that is kind of similar to what these these top 10 guys are making now i think you'll see a lot more disc golf agents. I think you'll, you'll see a lot more people that are trying to work with uh, outside companies, whether they're social media or other brands uh, that are just looking to endorse the players and kind of slap their name on, on the back of their shirts or jerseys. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a growing area. And I think something that is super interesting, I know to me. You look at the, what the next generation is going to go through. And if this sport's going to grow, um, it's definitely going to be through the endorsements and the sponsorships because the players are going to have to get away from being kind of that pyramid salesman kind of thing where you're out on the road and, hey, I just shot the best run of my life. Now let me go sell you 50 discs out of my trunk. Tiger Woods doesn't walk off the golf course and start selling golf balls. So until this game can get into that sponsorship endorsement area to where these players can at least make a living, that's the next level because I sure hope that that's where they get to um, because the money that can be generated from it, like you said, through these sponsorship, these endorsements, through that social media, through their websites, through people hopefully help, uh, helping them with their accounts and their merchandising and everything else that goes along with it, signing shows, things like that, where they come and they sign a disc instead of having to sell it. It, I think that that's, that's the next step, and I hope that that's where they get to because I think that's really what's going to legitimize the sport versus what we kind of have that structure, what has been, let's just say, for like the last 20 years since these manufacturing companies, the large three, have definitely been in charge of kind of riding that ship that way with the PDGA. Well, 
the PDGA might take the guides of the PGA and kind of go that same direction. Like I said, those guys aren't selling golf balls out of the back of their, out of the back of their truck when they're done with their round. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of parallels to the PGA and kind of the ball golf side and it's, it's really slow growth. I mean, when you look at the game of, of uh, ball golf, you know, it's been around for, I believe hundreds of years. I, I don't know when it started, but at, at least about over 300. Yeah, about 300, 300. years. Yeah. yeah, so it's had 300 years to gain steam, popularity, um, players, notoriety. I mean, all of it. And, and disc golf in kind is, is extremely young when you kind of compare the two. But really, uh, I think making strides with the ESPN appearances that we had this mm-hmm. year, we're starting to get some outside sponsors like Bushnell. Uh, we're starting to see some companies that are focusing on the disc golf market. Uh, I think of Idio Shoes is, is making a very disc golf specific item. And so I, I think as we kind of get more money in disc golf, which the last two years of growth has certainly expanded the pool of money that is involved in disc golf, I think we'll start seeing kind of more of these outside companies that are seeing profit within disc golf. And then once there's profit within disc golf, uh, you'll get a lot more endorsements and sponsorships because people are going to want to grab a piece of that pie. So I, I think it's, it's a slow snowball, but it certainly uh, is a snowball that has grown over the last couple of years. I hear you about the, the PGA being around for 300 years, but remember the internet wasn't and this social media wasn't <laughs> either. So their ability to, to gain steam took a lot longer because Horse and buggy and and smoke signals was a hard way to get your information. We're not getting that information that way anymore anyway. My second point to that is is I do agree with you. It's going to take, if you want to go by the PGA model of today's future, not the history of the future, they had large purses. Those sponsorships for a while came from cigarette companies, uh, beer companies, things like that, who would sponsor a million dollar purse, divide that up amongst the players and they're playing for so much money that it was worth them going out and, and traveling to make that kind of money abroad, whether it was the British Open, the U.S. Open, you know, uh, you know, whatever it was. So I think hopefully we can get to that point to where the purse is so large that the top 50 are going to be paid out enough to, like I said, make a substantial living, not have to worry about having to travel and stay there and eat and the other things like that. So that's my hope that we see that much more in an exponential factor, because like I said, we have the tools now that they did not have in the past, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. We can only hold on to that. We can only hold on that model for so long. It's a different era. I, I, well, had, I had, had one thought uh, about that, um, kind of on that, along those lines. So in, when you watch ball golf, you've, you've hit a ball golf. And so you know how incredibly complicated and how amazing it is to hit a ball golf straight, even a putt. And so you're amazed. And so when you, when you watch disc golf and I'm talking about, like, say my brother, who's, who, who's kind of a new fan to it. Um, he's not quite as amazed because it just on screen, it just looks like you're throwing a, a Frisbee. Um, does Discraft do anything to reach out to those kind of people? Um, I mean, how do you reach the casual who's never picked up a disc? I mean, I know that, I know that the, you know, the companies that are putting out the content right now, which is like the Pro Tour and and uh, Joe Mez and all those guys, they do a great job at, at really making it look fun and spectacular for me. But I'm also been throwing discs for 20 years. So uh, how do you reach those people who don't who've never thrown a disc? I mean, what's yeah, the thing in there? I think this is the million dollar question because disc golf has grown so much in the last two years. I'm I'm sure you guys see it. The courses are all busy uh, everywhere you go. We have so many people playing disc golf, which I think is, is really amazing. And it's kind of been the goal of growing the sport. But I I think the new goal is kind of where you're going with this question is how do we get more people interested and enamored with disc golf, but you know, maybe they don't necessarily want to go out and play disc golf every single day. You know, maybe they want to just go play like once a month, but they love to watch uh, Paul and Eagle throw 550 feet. So I think the next step for growing disc golf, and especially on the, the financial side, the money side, so that these guys can make more of a living doing it, is how do we bring in these dollars from people that are, are just interested in disc golf? 
because I'll, I'll use the example of uh, football. You know, I'm, I'm a Detroit Lions fan, which I don't recommend. <laughs> uh, but and so I own, uh, you know, a hat, a shirt. Uh, I own a couple football cards of my favorite players. But I have no interest in putting on pads and going and being tackled by, you know, a 350 pound guy. So how do we get people that are like that, that are just fans of disc golf, interested in buying shirts, maybe buying some collector discs just to hang on their wall and look at and sort of bring in that money because that segment of people that exists out there is, you know, billions and billions of dollars. And if we could just pull in a portion of those people to spend their, their, discretionary income on on disc golf instead of uh football tickets or baseball gloves or you know any of those other number of sports things that people spend money on i think that's really uh a great question if you figure out the answer be sure and let me know <laughs> well here's uh, what, here's where i was thinking as you as you're talking i spent some i played some at, at rock hill and i spent some time in innova land and they put nine hole three hole you know, as many courses as they can put everywhere, yeah. which that's a huge advantage because you can't do that with ball golf. You can't put in a, a golf green or, you know, or a fairway just right in the middle of the neighborhood, but you can do it on, you know, on just somebody's yard. I mean, that size, um, I was working back in the day in the Dallas Fort Worth area and took a break and drove down the street and it was just a neighborhood and it's a little <coughs> tiny park and it had a basket. And, uh, and this was some 15, 20 years ago. And I was like, that is how you grow the sport. Bro. You know, um, you okay, Mayor? Oh <laughs> I think we lost Meredith. Uh -oh. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's, that's what, that, that's kind of where my mind went as far as reaching those kind of people is just putting baskets everywhere, you know, just yeah. like feed the place with baskets. Yeah, I think course course uh, installation is relatively cheap compared to a lot of things. You know, to buy nine baskets and you buy four, you know, a couple four by four posts and put some signs up is relatively cheap to install compared to a lot of other sports like building a tennis court or a baseball field or um, anything basketball like that. Court. Yeah, basketball courts. Yeah, so the the disc golf is is extremely cheap compared to so many other sports, and I, I think that you know, it's a good mission that I've had myself to just express that to, you know, my local parks and rec. Uh, I had put in a little nine hole course at the park that is just around the corner from me on about five acres of uh, wooded land. And I, I think that, you know, there, there's millions of little plots of five acres of wooded land that could certainly house nine hole courses. Uh, and they can be installed for relatively cheap. So I think getting people to these small courses is a a great idea. Uh, we're seeing a lot of kind of cross pollination, I guess I'll call it too, with professional disc golfers and other sport athletes. Uh, we kind of saw that with the, the disc golf pro tour celebrity event. I think that's one effort on their part to bring in kind of some of those people that I was talking about who, you know, we just want people to be fans of disc golf or, you know, fans of Paul Macbeth where they're going to buy a Paul shirt and a Paul disc and kind of spend their money within disc golf. So I think we're starting to see some of that kind of celebrity cross pollination, which will have uh, a little bit bigger effect maybe than what most people realize as uh, disc golf continues to grow and we try and find some of those dollars. So I, I think those little courses are a great way to do it. It is a, a big effort to get a course installed from fundraising to approval and uh, design and all of it. But I, I do think that's a good option as well. Mm -hmm. we, I'm a fan of the part two um, putter <laughs> course. And, and yeah. I, I'd, I'd like to see more of those pop up uh, because that's what I like to do. I mean, I, I'd spend most of my days on a part two if they had them. It's just I'm to that point now. I'm not going to go out and play 18 holes every day. Well, actually, I am. But <laughs> it's a lot easier if it's a part two. Um but yeah, uh, we, we, it also wanna... brings out the kids, you know, and brings out the, that are growing the sport when you have those little short uh, courses. Um, so in your area, like uh, go ahead and comparing it to uh, Rock Hill and, and how they just seed courses everywhere. I was amazed at that. Did they, is that happening in Michigan a lot around Discraft land? 
yeah, Michigan has a ton of courses and Discraft has been, you know, very instrumental in donating baskets and helping with design and stuff throughout their history. Um, they've been in Michigan. I, I forget what year they had moved over to Michigan, but I think it was, I want to say mid eighties at least. So they've definitely been instrumental in helping out with the number of courses throughout Michigan. Uh, pretty much all the baskets you'll see around Michigan are, are chain stars or, you know, maybe today chain star pros, uh, obviously with them being local, it helps a lot to be able to get baskets right, right in our state, but, uh, they do a lot of basket donations as well to new courses. Uh, they have some programs that help recycle old baskets to, uh, new courses or, or maybe upcycle if a certain course has, you know, maybe Mach ones or, <laughs> or something mm -hmm. really old. And, uh, a course is replacing their chain stars with chain star pros. Uh, Discraft has a program to give you a discount on the Chainstar Pros if you move the Chainstars over to another course um, to uh, help improve that course and, and just make the baskets a little bit better. So they, they definitely do a lot with, with courses. I think we're pretty lucky, like Texas, having such a long history with disc golf that, you know, you're, you're never really more than, I would say, a half hour from a course, no matter where you are, pretty much, unless you're you're really maybe in the middle of nowhere, but <laughs> um, we've got courses everywhere. And, and so it, it definitely is very accessible for anybody. Well, I think we've got Meredith back. Are you with us, Mayor? Uh, thank you. Sorry, my phone. Hey, guys, I wanted to reach, uh, ask about the, the underground interviews. Is that a way that people can kind of uh, look more into the touring pros and such, the team disc craft lives, or tell us about that? Yeah, so we had the underground interviews going for uh, several years where we had interviewed Discraft pros, uh, Discraft players, underground players as well, and kind of had some other segments in there. Um, we've been taking a little bit of a break from the interview side. I think we'll probably pick that back up this winter. Uh, my wife and I had a baby back about five months ago, and so that's taken up <laughs> uh, most of my time, but I do hope to get back to doing those interviews again this winter and just reach out to players. I, I think there's so many great players on team Discraft um, that, you know, maybe kind of like you said, guys that aren't always in front of the camera or aren't always getting interviewed, but still have really great stories to, to tell and people that are deserving of a little bit more attention maybe than they, they get. Um, I think of like Terry Roethlisberger, we did a interview with him and he's a name that, probably a lot of people have seen on the pro tour, but maybe they don't know a lot about him. And so we try and do a lot of the interviews with uh, as many of the big names as we can, but certainly some of the other names as well to try and give them some airtime and just give people a chance to sort of learn a little bit more about them and, and, uh, and their stories. That's so cool. Well, Wes, would you like to give a shout out to anyone? Um, Give a shout out to all of our underground people, especially anybody that's watching. <laughs> uh, we have a couple new people that'll be joining the team. Be sure and look out for announcements on the uh, Discraft Underground Facebook page. Uh, I'm sure they'll be on my page as well. A uh, couple new additions just this last week. We got a couple more additions coming, I think in the next week or so here as well. Uh, and then we have a couple people that we will be promoting from the underground to team Discraft. I think one of those got kind of announced today. Um, those are always really exciting. I, I am always a little bit sad to see some of my players go, but I know that that is the goal for, you know, several of the people that are on the team. And so it just really brings me a lot of joy to have, have kind of been a small part of their disc golf journey. And, and they're sort of on to bigger things. <laughs> um, that's probably about it. Shout out to Bob Julio if he's watching this for just the opportunity to have the underground uh, and to kind of trust me to sort of captain the team. And other than that, I think that that's probably it. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. It's been so great to get to know you and get to know more about the Discraft, Discraft Underground. And it's just been such a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Have a good night. You yeah, bet. Thank you, Wes. Thank Appreciate, you, Wes. It. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Well, that was well, awesome job, Mayor. Mayor, yeah. yeah cool. Sorry. I learned a lot. Yes, I did too. One, how do you communicate with 100 uh, people? How does he? How do you get in touch? How does that work, Mayor? <laughs> he he is really good at one on one. You can direct you can direct message him. He'll reach out. Um, we do have a Discraft Underground team page that we communicate a lot on. He he's really encouraging us to um cheer each other on to reach out to one another and get to know each other and um just root each other on out there in the media and even on our team and he's just such a he's i i really have enjoyed having him as a captain it's he's just an all-around great guy and encourages community you know what i mean i uh, definitely well that was um special thanks for uh bringing him on um it's good to hear from uh, the Discraft people, because as you know, I'm half Discraft, half Innova, <laughs> with a little bit of dynamic disc thrown in there. But um, you're missing Mint, but that's that's soon to come. <laughs> oh well, I hope so. Oh yeah, and, 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 a, and a little a little bit of Lucky Ace, Lone Star. Oh, Lone Star. I'm just kind of like uh, all over the place. Got a lot of stuff. I do like that jackalope a lot. That's yeah. a sweet We need to I work on it. Horn, so. I didn't know you actually had like your your own personal jackalope. No, I just threw Chris's once. And, oh. Uh, and love. Well, I mean, I love the plastic. As soon as I picked it up, all everything that Mint has put out since the very beginning, I knew that they were onto something with their plastics. And uh that's what I like about it. The feel, I mean, the discs are basically in of a, to me, uh, it felt like a leopard when I threw the jackalope and, yeah. uh, I love it. Love well, the plastic. Well, you got to throw that jackalope at the, uh, tournament that we're all going to be playing at the, the Blazin open. What is it? The, the, what, what's the tournament that we're going to be down there throwing the jackalope at again, that we're down there at Moody's. Lucky oh yeah, Aces. Blazing Summer Days. Lucky Aces Blazing Summer Days. The <laughs> Blazing <laughs> Summer Days. Well, behind you, as you can see, Hemi found a long lost toy there. Hemi, you want to tell him what this thing was? Of course, Chrissy's played this course. She had no earthly idea what it was. She just thought it was a marker. Of course, we walk up there and Hemi's like, oh no, this is the... It's got work. history right there. That is a tone tube. Got it right. Tone tube. <laughs> tube tone. Tube tone. Tone tube. <laughs> I always anyway, call it this tone is pole. what you used to throw at back in the day when you didn't play, but you did play with the hubcaps, right? This is what you were hitting those things with before they made discs. Is that what you were saying? Sometime in the 50s, these things were made? I'm not sure as I was born in 1977. <laughs> you were not born in 77 <laughs> but the unique thing about this thing is that that thing was pretty cool i mean the sound that it made was like a cowbell like you said so from a distance you could definitely hear it which is i had never seen one before and it but fits, back in totally fits moody's ranch because that's it's cow when we drove out i was like well why did he put the gate why did he close the gate He's got a disc golf course. And then I realized, oh, he's got cattle. Yeah, he's got the cows. And, and I wanted to go back to our adventure at Moody's with Chrissy this uh, past week. And what a wonderful time we had, not only with the juniors, but the next day on Sunday, we had the opportunity to play this course. And thank goodness I played it because being a Houstonian, y'all both introduced me to something I never played before. And that was much more of what's called, y'all call it like a sand course. And I'm telling you right now, First couple of throws are great, but then after that, you, you kind of feel like your whole round is nothing but just slowing you down, throwing your pace to the shot, your walk up to the shot. And then, of course, you had to miss the, the cow birthday Dog. present that they like to leave <laughs> you in the middle of the fairway. And yeah. then worst of all, and if you don't know, shame on you, but you better bring some tape for your shoelaces. And if I was you, I'd tape your socks. I, I just tape your you, from your knees down, I would take everything because the sticker birds out there are relentless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Playing, playing at Moody 
Aries is definitely a test of endurance mentally and physically. And uh, yeah, walking through that sand, that'll get you really tired really quickly. And so I'm really glad that the Blas and Summer Days that's coming up is only one round a day uh, because Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a lot of golf. Um, I don't even know how you guys had it in y'all to drive back to Houston on the same day because I got home and took a shower and popped on some disc golf and could barely keep my eyes open uh, whenever we were done out there. Yeah, especially after Mexican food. It was. It was yeah, like, food coma. Uh, <laughs> now, Amy, I did hear you say something. They're going to mow it. Well, they mow that area that you land in. That's called where the open players land. Oh, yeah. Okay? <laughs> the unmowed parts are where the people I play with, they land. And those parts are not going to be mowed. So they're going to be sticker birds. So I'm just warning everybody who plays with me or anybody else in that elk, be prepared. But the course is absolutely stunning. Beautiful place. Um, I was highly impressed. 110 acres. Had some water shots, tree shots, some open shots. We kind of got lucky, not much wind from what I've heard from both Chrissy and from David and from some other guys who played that course. Wind will definitely change that course like it changes any course. I don't think it got over about five to seven miles an hour, and that was until maybe the last two or three holes, and we were praying for that wind because it was a little bit on the warm side. I would <laughs> it say. was a little toasty, and it's got some sneaky <laughs> elevation out there too. Like, you know, when you're standing on the tee pad, you can't really – like see it that much but it really does um play a factor and you know i like what neil was saying is like you know moody's style of disc golf is to throw in the middle and stay in the fairway you know he's not a very flashy player he doesn't try to throw big hyzers or anything crazy or anything you know he just keeps it simple and in the middle and that's how he designed his courses and if you throw like that then you're not going to get in the sticker burst <laughs> mm -hmm. right I was so lucky to have such a great caddy yesterday, as Sammy said. I mean, I played great because I had two people, both Chrissy and Neil, going, shoot it right there. Even though I couldn't see the basket most of the time, I play well to that when someone just goes, go land your disc right there. Better than, like Kimmy said, when you let your ego take it over and say, I can do it on my own. When you're saying, no, just take something straight, just go right there. And so I ended up shooting very, very well. But I can yeah. imagine if you haven't played that course before, you best get out there beforehand. And I'm telling you, I'm going to go play that other course. If I don't play it, at least I'm going to walk it the day before just the other course just to make some notes of where you need to land because it is definitely, like Neil, you said, you need to know where to land on that course. And you can score well. It was very fun, very doable. Uh, yes. Make you throw all the shots. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I had a great time. And how about the fact, again, Hemi goes, hey, I want to introduce you to somebody. So we walk up there and typically him in my fashion, it always happens. Hey, so-and-so, you're so-and-so. Hey, where are you from? You're from here. Next thing you know, the owner of the place, he and I have played basketball on the same court. We played football <laughs> against each other. We ran track against each other. And we're in the same district <laughs> growing up as kids. And I'm like, is this not the smallest world? How do I run into somebody 145 miles away from home that I just happened to have like a six degrees of separation with. Once again, very strange in that, that as well. It always happens that way. <laughs> yeah, we love Dave. Um, I, I can't wait to play it. I'm looking forward to it and to see everybody out there. And uh, just to backtrack what we were talking about earlier about sand, I, I, I had, you know, I played there several times, Texas teams and, um, I can't remember all the events, but I played out there in B and C tiers and I played a lot. I never really thought about it having sand until until yesterday. And but it is such a factor, you know. Like Neil said, find the grassy spot on the tee pads because there are no tee pads. It's sandboxes. Mm -hmm. And and find the place where with the most grass. Um, that's my advice if you're gonna go play Blazin. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry oh, I'm dying. Like that is awesome blazing the blazing championship yeah that's awesome mm. yeah. what does it mean actually i don't know blazing yeah kind of like blah day blah <laughs> okay <laughs> all right anyway um 
no, I, I can't wait to play it either. Uh, I look forward to it. I don't know if we'll be able to stay out for those festivities. I'll tell you what, after one round, I don't know if you can stay up there Saturday night and just wait, party all night long, wait for Sunday to come. No, no. Uh, I'm going to go find much asset our age. What about you, Mary? You think you'll be able to stay up and party? Are y'all staying on property, aren't you? No, we got an Airbnb, but no, that's not really my style. I'll hang out for a little bit, but I like to go to bed around nine. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Agreed. Yeah, we we uh, I went back to get my Corvette that I lost on the hole near the cabin. And it was kind of miraculous that I found it because I'd already given up and uh, I was already going, well, I guess maybe somebody, maybe they'll call back, whatever. Anyway, so when I finally found it, I ended up right next to the, to the uh, Airbnb they have out there, the, uh, uh, the shack, I don't know what they call it, but, and all the people hanging out and it was, you know, Steph Vinson and you know, all the people that partied there the night before and uh, it just reminded me of those days when you partied like that <laughs> it made me tired just hanging out with them but anyway great people and i just wanted to say thank you chrissy for introducing us to all those awesome austin people you know just um just a pleasure to be around them um just such a great vibe out there i feel like i'm home that's one reason i i'm looking forward to it going back out there, just being out. And, and by the way, just cruising through Bastrop, uh, that's the new place, you know, for me, it's like, that's where everybody, that's where the exodus is into Bastrop. And back when I was living in Austin, my niece did that. And we were like, Bastrop, <laughs> why are you going to Bastrop? And, uh, and then her friend went there. And then a lot of people just sort of ended up in Bastrop and, uh, that's a cool place. Really liked it. We, I ended up kind of meandering through town and I'd never been through the downtown, the old side of town. We have been here for I, about three months now and we are absolutely in love with this little city. Um, we're like, we're like a mile off of the downtown strip that you guys, that you probably drove by. Um, you know, everybody here is just so friendly and it's like, it's like close enough to Austin to still, I guess, like kind of fall into that subcategory of living in Austin, but it's far enough away that it just, it feels like our own little thing out here. <laughs> like, you know, um, so I love, love, love it. The only thing that we need now is a legit disc golf course in Bastrop. So that is on the to-do list. <laughs> I can't believe there's not one. I know. I know there's, you know, been a bunch of talks at getting one at this park called Bob Bryant Park that's down by the river. Um, and then we actually had a comment on the fling show on the on our live feed from Nicholas Malukas, who had mentioned y'all need to build a course or, you know, we need to build a course at Bashop State Park, which is so true. My parents went camping out there in July and, you know, I rode my bike all over the place just exploring it. And there's so much amazing property out there. There could be some epic disc golf courses. Yeah, good luck with that. My father-in-law tried to build some houses in that area. And there's a thing called the horned toad that lives in there, which is some kind of very rare toad to Texas. And I'm telling you right now, they're not putting anything there that's going to put boots anywhere around that place unless you're on the trails. They're oh, so wow. stickers about it. And yeah, my, my stepfather back in the 90s, I believe it was, actually, there's an interview with him on Bastrop News where they were just grilling him over it. It was terrible. He was like, screw this, I'm out of here. They Maybe that's together. why they don't even let bikes on the trails at Bastrop State Park. Like literally the trails you can only walk. You can't even ride your bike on trails. Correct. Hmm. There's some extinct toad out there. And I'm, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just telling you that's how they feel about it. And you know, people in Austin, once they had the salamander that's extinct or something, anything they got their sights set on, you're not, they're, they're not going to budge on that. So I'd go down there and the other place down by the river, but that state park, You'd be beating your head against the wall on that one. 
Yeah, Nicholas said they removed the old ball golf course. It's mostly grown up now. And it's crazy when you drive into Bastrop State Park, like like kind of first when you enter and you go past the guard shack on the right, it's called like the like uh, golf pro, pro store storm shelter or something. I don't know. They like converted the old pro shop into some storm shelter. Um, so... Yeah, I got to play that course, and that's where they were trying to build houses on the course. Oh, wow. And I got to play that course when he, then they, were, they were out there, and uh, that's how. That's the only reason why I know this. You know, once again, it's silly minutia. I don't know why I know silly stuff like that, but I do. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they're sick. Like you said, they don't even let you ride bikes. I mean, they yeah. don't want feet crushing grass because that's what they eat or they sleep under or protects them or that habitat. And, I, and like I said, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm all for nature. So I'm the last person to want to destroy it. That's for sure. Well, Hey, the Lake, Lake Bastrop is just, I don't know, eight miles up the road from Bastrop state park. Maybe there are, and it's not, it's not a state or a government entity or anything as far Correct. as I know. So, Hey, maybe they will be a little bit more uh, open-minded to it. <laughs> I'd like to see you go that direction. That'd be awesome. That'd be super cool. Hey, so shout many- out, shout out to Jay um, Almagir. He's watching. We know it's blazing, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of we have a lot of like sticklers for uh correct English. I don't know. The two Z's is throwing throwing us off, I think. But. <laughs> it's not me. I just thought it was funny once they brought it up because I misspelled everything. So Jay, I'm on your side. You call it whatever you want. <laughs> But it it is blasting. There, so. There's got like I just want there's gotta be a reason. Like there's gotta be some kind of like no, like there's gotta be like a because it's really hot. You know, like like the like buzz so hot, three Z's. Disease. It's really, it's really stingy, you know. It's buzzy. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's, it's really hot. So it's blaze. They should have put two A's, I think. <laughs> we love you, Jay. We love yeah. you, man. All right. We well, better go before we get too silly. Chris is just on a roll today between yeah, I, uh, Chris and Parent. You know. Meredith all mad at me. <laughs> you didn't even know the movie reference. That is quick. Silly. I was a big dude <laughs> fan too. Did Back you say when... I should listen to my wife? I should have listened to Elizabeth, what you're saying? Yes. Oh, so she tried? I thought oh, she yeah. was slacking. Thank you for trying. No, no, she I... tried. Trust me. She's got back home. I had to give her a little what for. She just got back home. So I was like, I'm not listening to you. <laughs> we see how that worked out. Well, Mayor, thank you for uh, bringing Wes on. That yeah, was, that great was job. Cool. Nice. It was um, good to have a legit um, guest tonight. And uh, instead of us just yakking with each other, <laughs> just the four of us, which I love that, by the way. Hey, on a serious note, it's E minor. Just kidding. Okay. <laughs> That's a it's a joke. I'm it's sorry. Minute. It's a joke. No. Um, the serious note. That's a chord. Um, the serious note would be: I love you guys, and I love what we do, and I just thank you so much for you know bringing it every Monday, and uh, looking forward to seeing y'all. And uh, seeing you, Chrissy, in two weeks. And uh, yay! Because I don't think I'm going to be able to make it for that other nine. I think I know that other 18 on the other side. Hey, is it more than 18? Isn't it like 21 holes per day? Are they going to add? I hope not. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> that was four hours. Yeah. That was every <laughs> we threw a lot of hour rounds. Yeah, Chris threw a, a lot, lot of extra shots. shots. Chris yeah. did. For sure. Heck no, I didn't. I was, I was not this is getting was cranky tired. with me and I Neil. I was tired watching y'all throw. I, was like, I, I know. I, sh- I knew we shouldn't have trusted you and Neil alone together. Like back on the long boxes back there, and we were just over there on the short boxes trying to throw our shots, and then we got like 15 discs whizzing past our head. I'm like, what the? What is happening right now? <laughs> and then followed by a bunch of horticulturalist questions. I mean, it was like, hey, what's the stem on this? plant over here <laughs> well that's your asian vine plant from the southeast asian tip of thailand it's like what <laughs> what are y'all talking about back there well you see uh, that had some wasp on it because it's got wasp dung on it you're like 
Really? You guys got a glimpse into every single round that I play with Neil. <laughs> Marriage, I love it. I love it because I, I'm not a namer, you know, like I, I just see something that's pretty and take a picture of it. And people online will go, what is that? And, and they'll comment and they'll say, well, I was like, I don't know what it is. It's just it's pretty. But walking around with Neil, it was cool. He, he, he gave me not just the name, but the insight as to, you know, it's indigenous. It's, you know, yes. hard. It, it works great for this and that. And, and also, too, I've got some shrub issues in my backyard. So I got a lot of free counseling from neil and i thank you neil for that it's great i love him around with neil all right neil is gonna be our next guest on the show yeah let's bring neil on next time talk well, about what plants you want in your backyard play. you've got to take care of yeah what's That's that right. what'd you say they talk about what plants you want in your backyard and he has you taken care of oh, although i will that. say this man can he throw oh my goodness gracious that young He's man so has got an arm I mean, to pow, it looks like a cannon coming out. Yeah, it's I was unreal. thinking today, I was thinking that I need to go get a strike. Yes. For sure. Or you something like, like a fast and flippy. And because he did some work with that. And yeah, he can throw it 450 plus. Yeah, he was averaging 350 at least. That young man's got an arm. Yeah, he does. Well, yes. all right, y'all get some sleep. It's past your bedtime, Meredith. It yes, sure it is. is. 16 minutes. She's past her bedtime. <laughs> All right, guys. Until next time, go Good throw night, something in the air and play disc golf. Go. Play, play. disc golf. Especially play. with your dog. Play, Good night. Play, play disc golf. Peace. Bye.